I want to welcome and thank you all for attending our second annual Chesapeake Charities Luncheon, and where we are recognizing three individuals who exemplify the qualities of leadership and community service. Today's focus is on the opiate crisis. Today is all about saving lives. We are thrilled to have all of you here today to support this very, very worthwhile cause. But first, I'd like to recognize our generous sponsors for their very, very generous support. Because I was trying to think of a better word than generous, but that says it all. And we couldn't have this luncheon, and we couldn't do what we do without our sponsors. Our platinum sponsors are the Chesapeake Bay Beach Club, John and Deirdre Wilson. Woo! The WHBG Certified Public Accountant. Over here. Pat Mayer. Our gold sponsors are the Anne Arundel Medical Center, the Customer Relations Metrics, the Elks Club of Kent Island, Annapolis, and Easton, KRM Development, Ride Entertainment, Shore United Bank, and the Marksman Company. Thank you all of our gold. Please see in your program an entire list of all our sponsors, including our many silver and bronze sponsors. And I just want to mention, we exceeded the number of sponsors this year than we, did la than we had last year. And that was just a tremendous, tremendous relief to all of us who are organizing this event. <clears throat> and I thank you. Um, I would like to also thank so much, from the bottom of my heart, the members of my committee for the wonderful work they did. And I'd like to ask each of them to please stand as I say their name. You don't need to clap applause after each one because that'll take a long time and they will understand. <clears throat> but it's Selena Barrett, D Diana Waterman, Kathy Diotis, Jody Gray, Carlene Hurd, Jamie Kirkwood, Paula Warner, and Deirdre Wilson. Thank you for making this event a great success. <clears throat> for those of you who don't know too much about Chesapeake Charities, let me just give you a very brief overview. We make charity happen. That is our logo. Chesapeake Charities is a community foundation we are experts in philanthropy and provide financial and administrative support to more than 85 charitable nonprofit organizations in the Chesapeake Bay region. And even though we are headquartered in Queen Anne County, we represent the majority of counties, both on the eastern and the western shores, that, are, that touch the Chesapeake Bay. We bring together the donors, the nonprofits, the businesses, and the government agencies to address the needs of this large community. And all of this good work is done with less than 4% administrative costs. You check other nonprofits, you'll find... I don't think you will find another one with that 4%. I used to be very active and um, chaired the multiple sclerosis, the national multiple sclerosis, and 4%, we never saw 4%. <laughs> um, so all of the money that you donate, the majority of all the money you donate goes directly to those in need. We are so happy that you're here today to help in this uplifting celebration of compassion and goodness in our community. Our focus is on the heroin and the opiate crisis, and those who are finding solutions through education, prevention, and rehabilitation. For the next hour, you will learn about people who may be your neighbors 
in your community who are making personal sacrifices to get this done and to create a better world for all of us and to save lives. I'm delighted to introduce our very first presenter. He's a very dear friend of mine, a former colleague, and who's doing a phenomenal job for the state of Maryland as our Lieutenant Governor. And he's going to speak today about his role as chairing the Opiate and uh, Heroin Task Force. Please welcome my friend, Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford. Thank you, Audrey. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, it is great to be here. It's always great to be on the Eastern Shore, and particularly on a lovely day like today. Um, I was at an event yesterday that was outdoors, and it was cold. I forgot my coat, uh, but it feels great today. I did forget my coat again today, but I didn't need it. <laughs> so, like I said, thank you. And Audrey, thank you for all the incredible work you've done for the state of Maryland and continue to do. And thank you very much for inviting me here today. I know we took a little bit back and forth of whether I could come or whether I couldn't come, but um, we're here. So thank you again for your patience. And I want to thank everyone with the Chesapeake Charities and everyone who supports this great charity. Um, it is my sincere pleasure, I think the first thing that I'm to do here is to present the Governor Larry Hogan Scholarship Award. Now, I believe this is the first time it's been awarded, so I get that distinction. Wait till I tell the Gov. Uh, <laughs> this scholarship was established last year to celebrate, um, la at last year's celebration of charity event in the Governor's name for students who have chosen to devote their lives to finding cures for cancer. This year, our scholarship winner is Joshua Alexa, a fourth year medical student at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, who has chosen for, who was chosen for his excellence in clinical research. Joshua is a graduate of St. Mary's College of Maryland. He was magna cum laude, something that I didn't achieve, <laughs> and has a Bachelor's of Arts degree in biochemistry with a minor in mathematics. Obviously, he chose not to go to law school because he, was, he could do mathematics, and unlike me, I would go to law school instead. Uh, he is the first person in his family to attend medical school and has been described as an upbeat, engaging young man who re routinely is cited for his professionalism, his work ethic, and his oral and written communication skills. One of his evaluators described Josh as the most knowledgeable and best medical student with, them, with whom he had ever worked. His peers say that he is patient and always has a positive attitude and that the compassion and empathy that he shows with patience is uplifting. I know that Governor Hogan would be very proud to know that the scholarship in his name is going to someone like Joshua. So please join me in congratulating our recipient of the of Governor Larry Hogan Scholarship Award, Joshua Alexa. Well, that's a well-deserved recognition. Congratulations again to you. Now, at this time, it's my pleasure to present the Philanthropist of the Year Award. Um, as Secretary Scott, Audrey Scott, Councilwoman Scott, all the other things that you've done, uh, stated you know, the governor had asked me to, to chair uh, the emergency opioid and heroin emergency task force. And this kind of grew out of our campaign, which was now over three years ago, close to four years ago, that we were traveling around the state. And we began to realize, as we talked to local officials in virtually every jurisdiction that we were in, 
that the number one issue that they were facing was the heroin and opioid epidemic. And it didn't matter if, it, if we were in Baltimore City or we were here on the shore uh, in western Maryland or small towns in between. We were hearing the same thing over and over again, that heroin was tearing apart families, tearing, about, tearing apart communities. It was overrunning local and state efforts to address this public health, this law enforcement and social crisis. And so a couple of months after taking office and one of his, the governor's earliest executive orders was to create the um, Heroin and Opioid Emergency Task Force, as well as the Interagency Heroin and Opioid Coordinating Council. And he asked me to chair both of those, those, those committees. And so in the last three years, our administration has been aggressively working to employ a strategy that focuses on prevention and treatment, recovery, as well as enforcement. And we strengthened our Good Samaritan law as well as trained individuals on the overdose response program. We expanded our prescription drug monitoring program and passed guidelines to limit the dosage and duration of opioid prescriptions. We also launched a statewide campaign called Before It's Too Late to raise awareness and encourage parents to talk to their kids about the dangers of heroin and opioid abuse and other uh, matters that we have been working on in the last couple of years. In March of this year, the governor declared a state of emergency in response to the continued escalation of this crisis. We activated our opioid operational command center to more rapidly coordinate between state and local agencies and we dedicated an additional $50 million in new funding over five years to address these, these issues. We're learning and have learned that it's the local level, it's at the local level, the neighborhoods, the schools, the faith organizations, where we're going to make our biggest impact. And we're seeing real promise in some of our Maryland communities, which leads me to our philanthropist of the year. Bernie Fowler Jr. is a humanitarian with a gift for planting seeds that yield powerful results, food for the hungry, hope for those in need of a second chance, and healing for those who are battling addiction. His vision to distribute food to families in need quickly grew into something much more, transforming a farm into a place of redemption and hope. Bernie's gifts to the residents of Southern Maryland are not a thing of normal that you normally think of in philanthropies, things like scholarships or endowments or university buildings. Instead, the things that Bernie is providing are such things as substance for life, food, fellowship, and a sense of belonging. Born and reared, see my, my Talking point says raised, but I was told that you rear children, you raise chickens, so I, I didn't correct this part. So, so back to the speech. Born and reared in Calvert County, Bernie is the son of former State Senator Bernie Fowler Sr. and Betty Fowler. I understand both are here today. did a good job. <laughs> After, and he graduated from Calvert High School and went on to work at Calvert Cliffs Nuclear Power Plant. After attending the police academy, he joined the Calvert County Sheriff's Department, fulfilling his childhood dream to become a policeman. He later started Bernie Fowler Homes, a custom home building company that he ran for more than two decades. When the economy went down in 2008. Bernie nearly lost everything in that recession. But he never gave up, and he never stopped looking for ways to serve. One day while visiting the Maryland Food Drop, he saw several of his former employees and families in the line receiving canned and boxed goods. In a state where agriculture is our number one industry, Bernie envisioned a way to provide hungry families with fresh fruit and vegetables. 
while helping local farmers struggling to make ends meet. He partnered with Serenity Farms, a 272-acre farm in Hughesville, to establish Farming for Hunger, a nonprofit organization that produces fruits and vegetables for area food banks. Never in his wildest dreams did he imagine the results that would come about five years later. Farming for Hunger has distributed over 8 million pounds of fresh produce in the region. He's created unique partnerships with local farms, churches, businesses, and schools, as well as the Maryland Food Bank, the Maryland Department of Corrections, and a network of hundreds of volunteers who work side by side each week at Farming for Hunger to grow, harvest, and distribute food to those in need. In 2013, Bernie began working with local correctional facilities to create a work program for inmates to help harvest produce. Life sharing, as Bernie called it, started on the farm when the first volunteer group sat down with incarcerated workers for some real talk. The impact on the inmates as well as the community was astonishing. He established the Second Chances program, which provides job training and life skills to prepare inmates for reentry into the world. So far, 94 inmates have completed this pro program, and only about 3 or 4 percent of recidiv recidivism has occurred. The Farming for Hunger is often approached by other towns and states who want help creating their own version of this program. When the heroin epidemic hit Southern Maryland, grew, growing to claim more than 100 lives in four years, and nearly that of his own child, Bernie realized that the farm could do more than feed people. It could inspire young people to make positive life choices. Prevention and recovery activities were added for high school students and youth tempted by the lure of the drug culture. The program includes workshops taught by participating inmates who share their struggles, mistakes, recovery, and hope. The success of the program has inspired other communities to fight the drug epidemic through education and community engagement. Bernie's daughter has recovered and is telling her story to others, including how her former drug dealer, who was one of the inmates sent to, the, to work on the farm, has been involved. Each year in May, Serenity Farms holds a tri-county memory walk to mourn those lost to drug addiction and to plant seeds of hope for those who are still struggling with this disease. The heroin crisis is hurting a lot of individuals and families, but Bernie Fowler Jr. is helping members of his community learn that they are not alone. For feeding the hungry, to restoring hope, and healing the community, we honor Bernie Fowler Jr. as our philanthropist of the year. Please come up now. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Rutherford, for that introduction, and I'll just be brief in a few moments here. I really want to thank Chesapeake Charities for hosting this event. This is just an amazing event, and to get the call from Linda to be named the Philanthropist of the Year, I was, I was shocked. This is not what we do it for. It's a labor of love. To be totally honest with you, it probably saved my life, starting for, for Farming for Hunger. I share with everybody that the, the good Lord put me in time out for about three years. When the building industry took a real downturn, I had to lay the last of 14 employees off and I found myself in a really broken place. 
so low I got to the point where I was contemplating suicide the summer of 2009. It's a horrible place to be at, but I believe it's what led me to where I am today, to be able to help others to understand what that place feels like, to be that person in the con to be in control and then lose that control. When Rose and I started Farming for Hunger in 2012, it was to raise food for the hungry community, to address hunger. It wasn't until 2014 that we really understood that hunger comes in a lot of different forms. And it was when I had to put my daughter out of our pickup truck, January 2014, and place her suitcase on a sidewalk at a 7-Eleven and tell her, tonight I give you back to God. He's either going to use you or he's going to take you. And we drove them off. That same year, the farmer I was working with lost his daughter on the farm. He found her in the farmhouse with a needle in her leg. I knew at that point in time that we had to incorporate alcohol and drug programs into Farming for Hunger. It was being revealed slowly. This whole process of five years has been a slow reveal. But I knew it was something that we needed to do. In 2015, an inmate came out to the farm. His name is Rico Nelson. He was there for two seasons. Rico was one of the largest drug dealers in the Southern Maryland area. He caused a lot of damage to our community. But when he came to the farm shy, he was also an individual that turned his life around at the farm. Because for the first time in his life, he felt love and he felt he belonged to a family. And I think that's the essence of Farming for Hunger. It's a place where there's hope, where there's faith, where there's love, where there's compassion, when there's understanding, and where there's forgiveness. And I would be amiss not to recognize Rico here today. I'm so proud of this young man. He got out last December. The Office of Crime Prevention, the Governor's Office of Crime Prevention, allowed us to, to get a grant. He is now in area high schools uh, multiple days a week, giving back to the community that he once destroyed. He's doing an amazing job. He has spoken to thousands of students and assemblies. Uh, Rico, could you please stand up? I think you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> and Lauren, if you'll wave to everybody. This is my daughter, Lauren, who's been in recovery over three years. It's a place where Lauren and Rico came together, a place where my life was saved, and a place where we can give back to the community. And I think that's where we're, what we've evolved into, and that's where we're at today. We want to work together, the three of us, and Michelle, and different ones that are here, Pam from our nonprofit, to plant a seed in our children, and to help them with the next steps in their life, and to nurture them along the way. And that's where we're at today. We have a saying, all are fed at the farm. Please come visit us and come and get fed at the farm. Thank you very much. Well, what an inspiration there. Um, my last task is to introduce Clay Stamp, the director of the governor's, or the state opioid operational operations control center. Um, and so he is gonna be presenting the volunteer of the year award. And Clay has a long history in Talbot County as an emergency manager. 
We selected clay because of that, the background to operate what we call the OCK. And he is, at one point, was Maryland's Emergency Management Director, Agency Director. And so I want to ask Clay to come up at this time. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good afternoon. That's a hard act to follow. So it's great to be here today. Real people with real problems that care. You know, the, the governor asked me to step into this role eight months ago. And as an emergency manager, I'm used to managing crisis, whether it be a hurricane, an environmental crisis. We get really smart people in the room and we look at the problem and we, we, we drive a solution and then we drive it to remedy the issue. This crisis is different. I had no idea how difficult this crisis is, but it's gonna take a movement of people to change the direction of it, and we're seeing it happen across Maryland. We're seeing good people in the areas of expanding treatment, recognizing that people that have the disease of addiction or substance use disorder are better off in treatment. Instituting prevention in our schools through the education system, because we know that they're our future. And we as a nation have seen, our, we, we've, we've, we've handled these challenges before. Smoking used to be cool and it's not now, right? We need to educate our children to help overcome this crisis. So I was asked today to, uh, to present um, the award to a friend of mine who's being honored, honored for Volunteer of the Year. And it's a, truly an honor for me. Joe Gamble, Sheriff Joe Gamble, Coach Joe, uh, I met when he ran for sheriff in Talbot County and I was the emergency services director in Talbot County. And we sat down and we talked and I started learning a little bit about Joe. And he has some traits that I admire that I want to mention to you. He's a good listener. He's empathetic toward others. Now this is a man that had years and years of service with the Maryland State Police. A matter of fact, the Maryland State Police created a homicide unit after his successful work. And he dealt with people and, and, and handled very difficult situations. But he has a way of being empathetic when he's dealing with people. He meets them where they are. And that's an incredibly powerful trait. He loves kids. Sheriff Joe, Coach Joe, he shows up and he hands them his badge. He gives them he, everything but his gun. Right? They, they, they ask him for the gun, but he, he, he draws the line there. But they love him. They love him because he knows that our future are our children. Right? They're our future. And he taps that. He's community oriented. And I mean, he's here to be honored today because he had this vision. Of which he called me about the vision when I was still in Talbot County. He said, you know, I got this idea about turning Talbot County purple. I was like, oh, okay, Joe, what's that? <laughs> he says, I believe that, you know, prevention is the key to addressing this opioid crisis. And I believe that if we get the community pulled together around this project purple, and we bring in a former MBA star to come talk to our kids and get the business community rallied up, we can send a strong message of support to combat stigma, right? Because we have to combat the stigma in this crisis. And we know what stigma is. Stigma makes it so people don't want to say they need help. Stigma keeps people in a lonely place. And we need to fight that. And so the Project Purple effort was to fight stigma. And he had that vision. So, without further ado, I want to uh, call Joe up. Coach Joe, Sheriff Joe, on behalf of the Chesapeake Charities, we want to honor you as Volunteer of the Year. Thank you.
say something now, Joe. Thank you, Clay. Thank you, Clay. Um, and thank you, Chesapeake Charities, for this wonderful event. Um, I actually feel a little embarrassed to be up here um, because when we first started working on Talbot Goes Purple, um, there's nothing I've done in my life that was successful without women. <laughs> um, so the, the first thing I did right was I married my wife Mary of nearly 30 years who stood by my side through a lot of uh, crazy ideas, a lot of um, interesting times uh, running across the state working homicides on her birthday and her kids' birthdays and Christmas and holidays. So thank you. I love you. You're the love of my life. And there's some special people here today I want to acknowledge. Kelly Hall, who's been an instrumental part of in my career. Um, and I, I especially want to thank um, my partner in crime. My, my wife, Mary, calls her my purple wife. <laughs> um, Lucy Hughes of Tidewater Rotary. Um, she's just amazing. And she's been, uh, I'm going to scratch my name out and put her name on this award uh, when I get back to my office. What, what, um, what happened with me was this, was that after a, a doing 17 years in the state police homicide unit, traveling all over the state, I worked a case in Talbot County. It was a homicide in Talbot County. It was one of the last homicides I worked. And when I worked that case, it involved a young man that I had coached. And what I learned, because Tal Talbot County doesn't have a, a, large, a, a high homicide rate, was we interviewed about 60 kids, half of which I had coached or my sons or daughters had played sports with at high school. And I've been a coach at Easton High School for about 12 years. And I knew all these, I knew the bulk of these kids. And what these kids were telling me, were talking about drug problem, the, the drug epidemic. And they were saying, this kid and this kid and this kid are addicted to heroin. And this kid and this kid and this kid are doing pills. And this kid's doing this. And as a citizen, I was shocked. As a police officer, I shouldn't have been shocked, but I was shocked. These are good families. These are two-parent homes. These are not what I learned in seventh and eighth grade. This, you know, we're not, uh, this wasn't a stereotypical drug problem. And I knew this because I'd been working all across Maryland, but I really, really didn't realize that it, it had come home. Um, so what really changed the way I looked at it was I interviewed three kids that were heroin addicts that I had coached at Easton High School, who were there in their mid-20s, right before I took office. Um, and then the first day that I took office, a woman walked into my office named Valerie Alby. She, dem she demanded to see the sheriff. Like, I didn't even know what I was supposed to be doing yet. It was my first day. Um, her daughter had died of a heroin overdose. And she wanted to know what I was going to do about it. And then I met countless people in Talbot County and the surrounding counties that lost their loved ones, and lost their daughters, lost their sons. And... Um, so well, we, we've got to do something about this. So our team put together, we put our team together, Tidewater Rotary, I gave a talk similar to this. Tidewater Rotary, Lucy Hughes at Tidewater Rotary was all in. And uh, we went after Talbot County with the help of Kelly Callahan from Soul Candy Media. And, we, and it, there wasn't, what was amazing, there wasn't an office we walked in, there wasn't a business that we walked in, there wasn't a person that we contacted to ask to donate money to help with this educational effort that said no. Because every one of them, every business, every family had been impacted in some way by this epidemic. So we reached out to our churches, our homeowners associations, our firehouses, our businesses, um, and we turned the county purple and we sent an educational message um, that people have asked me, well, what now? Well, we just kicked off. You know, we're in the game, we're finally in the game, or we're in the ring and we're swinging. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, we've got a lot of work to do on the educational front. But as you talk with your group of friends, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you a little prevention message. When you talk to your friends, and the first time I did this, I did it in front of 400 people at a fundraiser. They gave me five minutes to speak. And I said, raise your hand if you talk to your kids about drinking and driving. Every hand in the room always goes up. I've done this in front of probably six or 8,000 people now in all the places that we've talked. Every hand in the room will go up. Raise your hand if you talk to your kids about seatbelts. Every hand in the room will go up every single time. 
ask them, raise your hand, if you've talked to your kids about prescription opiates. The first time I did that in front of 400 people, less than 10%, and I think half of them were lying, <laughs> raised their hands. So that was our message, that's part of our message, and there's a lot more about that message, but kids just don't get it. They don't understand the connection. And we need to educate, we need to continue to educate and help those that are in addicted. Congratulations, you, you did an outstanding, you're doing outstanding work on that farm. Um, and we need more of that in our community. But what, where I can leave this is that I, 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 didn't, I couldn't believe, we kicked off on September 1st, by September 2nd, we were overrun with requests to speak, requests to educate. We were in the high schools, we were in the middle schools, we were at every community group there was. We spoke over 150 times in less than a month to different groups. And what, what it said to me, and we reached out to our business community, John, thank you. We reached out to John, met him right here, and he opened the Tidewater up to us and did, did some great stuff, but it was business leaders like you that really made this thing take off. And it's a message of hope. It's a message that we can make a difference. We will make a difference. We're just now getting in the fight. We're years behind where we should be. But we're going to catch up and we're going to turn this thing around. And it's going to take every single one of us. Thank you very much for this award. Thank you for this honor. Lucy Hughes, thank you for all your work and dedication on this project. And Kelly. Um, Kelly Callahan, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Linda Kohler, the Executive Director of Chesapeake Charities, and it has been a privilege to recognize the work of Bernie Fowler and Joe Gamble. And it's certainly my honor to introduce the nonprofit of the year. The Samaritan House was established in 1971 by recovering addicts who saw a need for residential treatment in the Annapolis area. They believed recovery from addiction was a long term process, and they wanted to create a place where one addict could reach out and help another, which is the foundation of every 12 step program and a key component in evidence based models that address addiction. As the first state-certified halfway house for men in the Annapolis area, the Samaritan House filled a void for long-term residential treatment. Approximately 75 clients are served each year, and with the rising addiction rates in Maryland, the need for these services is even greater today than it was 40 years ago. Clients come to the house once they're medically stabilized and have completed inpatient treatment and are, or are referred through the legal system mental health agency or a medical facility. Some even come on their own when they've exhausted other options and have nowhere to turn. Recovery services and activities are provided under the guidance of a professionally trained staff with 24 hour a day supervision to allow for consistent support, safety, accountability and services. Their executive director, Michael Goldfaden, has been with the Samaritan House for over 20 years. The Samaritan House accommodates 16 men in the transitional program and nine men in the residential house for clients who wish to continue their treatment for up to a year in a sober living environment. The program provides intensive individual and group counseling, case management, relapse prevention, and life skills training. While at the Samaritan House, clients must obtain employment or be engaged in purposeful activities that support personal responsibility and career or life goals. The organization's mission is to reintegrate clients into the local community and society at large as fully functioning members, free from the use of alcohol or illicit drugs. The Samaritan House has been changing lives for over 40 years. It provides men on the journey to an addiction-free life with the tools they need to recover. In the process, families are rebuilt, jobs are secured, Communities gain productive members who contribute to society. The Samaritan House believes in the power of one sober member helping another. Their motto aptly summarizes the theme for today's entire luncheon. We can do together what we cannot do alone. 
for their unwavering commitment to long-term recovery for addicts, alcoholics, and their families, Chesapeake Charities honors the Samaritan House as the Nonprofit of the Year. Uh, it's an honor to be here on behalf of the Samaritan House. Uh, I want to thank Linda and Chesapeake Charities. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. It's amazing to be here, especially uh, you know, discussing the opiate the opioid epidemic, um, the stigma that was talked about earlier. Anything we can do to reduce that stigma, I think, is in, is, is incredibly effective and powerful. Um, Bernie talked about the farm changing his life. Uh, the Samaritan House saved my life, changed my life. 26 years ago, I was a client there. And here I am today, you know, speaking on behalf of the house. And, you know, I try not to forget that every day, every single day I go into work. I, I try to keep in mind that, um, you know, the Samaritan House does change lives. It does save lives. It's a very difficult, for those of you, probably every single person in this room, who has some family member somehow, you know, is, is, has, uh, you know, in, been impacted by addiction. Uh, it's a very difficult population. It can be incredibly frustrating. You know, we hear about the statistics, we hear about this and that, and, and I prefer to, to focus on the hope and the, you know, the, you know, the fact that people do recover, and uh, we see that all the time uh, at Samaritan House. and. Um, it's incredibly affirming. Uh, I was a heroin addict uh, 26 years ago. I went to the Samaritan House, so it's kind of apropos that we're talking about the opiate addiction uh, or the opiate epidemic. Uh, I've been with the Samaritan House 20, over 25 years. I've never seen anything like uh, the opioid epidemic in the last several years. Anne Arundel County in particular has been uh, hard hit. Uh, I think Anne Arundel County is uh, you know, population-wise, uh, the second, uh, you know, in the state, the second leading county as far as uh, overdose deaths. Um, we've lost a lot of people. It seems like every week there are three or four people that I hear about um, overdosing and dying from heroin or opiates. You know, it's gotten to the point where I'm afraid to look at my phone sometimes. Or I get a text or I get a phone call or, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's frightening, really. Um, we get phone calls every day. <clears throat> you know, we could have a, I could hire a part-time staff person really to, to answer the phone and to field phone calls from family members or, you know, possible referrals themselves um, struggling. And it's almost always heroin or opiates uh, in the last several years. Probably at least 75% of our clients are, are uh, suffer from uh, opiate use disorder. Um, again, I, I've never seen anything like it in my 25 years. And, um, you know, again, every day we get phone calls and it's, it's kind of heartbreaking to have to tell people, you know, we have a waiting list, you know, here are some referrals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, which really leads me to, uh, you know, our capital campaign, our expansion that we're, you know, we're doubling in size. We're hoping to break ground next year. Part of that, much of that was really, um, you know, sort of spurred on by this opiate epidemic and the waiting list that we have. We have a waiting list, you know, and again, it's heartbreaking to have to tell somebody, you know, I'm sorry, you know, we have a 30 day, at least a 30 day, maybe 60 day wait. Um, there aren't enough programs, there aren't enough beds, there's not enough treatment. And, you know, we're hoping to do something about that very, very soon. Next year, we're going to open up our new house and we'll be able to, you know, we'll double our capacity and we'll keep on fighting fight. And uh, again, I want to thank Linda and everybody with Chesapeake Charities. It's an absolute honor to be here. Thank you so much.
I told someone that you wouldn't leave here with a dry eye, and I think that's coming true, at least for me. <laughs> um, I would just like to add a few things, and this isn't in my comments, but it's in my heart. And this program could not have taken place, and Chesapeake Charities would not be anywhere near as successful as it is without two people who are our right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg, and that is Linda Cola and Meg Gallagher. Linda Cola and Meg Gallagher. We do what we do with one and a half staff, one full-time, one part-time and then a host of volunteers. And the volunteers also include the committee that you met earlier and our board of directors. And at this time, I'd like to ask our board of directors to please stand where you are. And we've tried to distribute you throughout the room so you'd be sitting at a sponsor table and you could really talk up Chesapeake Charities. <laughs> so I hope, I hope they've all done that. But anyway, if my board members, Jody Gray, Paula Warner, please stand, Kate. Royden Powell, Pat Marr, Diana Waterman, Elaine Harrison. Thank you so much and thank you for always supporting us and being there whenever we call and doing the job that needs to be done. On your table, um, you will see a, um, no, excuse me, it's not on your table, I was told it's inside your program. There's a card. And on that card, um, if you would like, you could indicate if you would like to make an additional contribution. Part of my job is to ask for money. People ask me, what do I do? And I say, I dial for dollars. And it's at the point where a lot of people don't want to take my phone call. And Bill Childs will tell you that. Um, but anyway, um, we set up a special fund. Last year, we set up the scholarship fund for the cancer um, uh, research and for the medical student. And this year, because of the heroin opiate focus, we're setting up a special fund at Chesapeake Charities that the um, fire departments can apply for, for training and for the special equipment that's needed to respond to the opiate cases. Because they need special gloves, vests, and masks. And most of the fire departments, certainly all of the fire departments on the Eastern Shore, which are all volunteer, do not have that kind of money in their budgets to purchase the equipment. So first of all, the money uh, will be available for training and for equipment. And we will be giving out all of the um, proceeds that we have raised today through the sponsorships and the ticket sales after expenses um, for that purpose. And if you would like to add to that fund, we have included these cards for your um, benefit and the benefit of the first responders. Um, now, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker. Lisa Hillman, she's a good friend of mine of long standing, and I first met her many years ago as the wife of the mayor of Annapolis, Richard Hillman. And our paths crossed because I also happened to have been a mayor. And uh, we became really good friends. And I always knew Lisa as the wife of the mayor of Annapolis, Richard Hillman. But I very, very soon realized that Lisa Hillman was not the wife of Richard Hillman, Richard Hillman was the husband of Lisa Hillman. <laughs> Lisa has been the development professional for more than 35 years. She's the former president, and many of you may have had an opportunity to interact with her in this role as a president of the Anne Arundel Medical Center Foundation, where she was extremely successful, and she was also a former broadcast journalist in Baltimore. Lisa is a board member of Pathways and Samaritan House, programs that serve addicts. She lives in Annapolis with her husband, Richard, and their greyhound, Harry, and is the proud mother of two children, Heidi and Jacob. 
Her book, Secret No More, was published this year, 2017. It's her first book, and we are extremely fortunate because like all of the people who have great demands on their times, and especially like Joe Gamble mentioned, she's, the requ she's requested all the time to speak to groups, and um, she does it to help spread the word. We're very fortunate and grateful to her to be with us today to tell her story, and please join me in welcoming Lisa Hillman. Can y'all hear me okay? So as the keynote speaker, I have you for the next three hours, right? Can you hear me, can you hear me okay? Yes. Wow, what a wonderful audience. Uh, a lot of friends here. I need to start by saying to Bernie, to Lauren, to where's Rico? To Rico, to, um, who am I missing? To where's, where's Sheriff Joe? Right here. Sheriff Joe and to Mike. It's, um, it's an honor for me to share the same space with you. So congratulations on getting these awards, so well deserved. Thank you guys for inviting me. Thank you, Chesapeake Charities. What I'd like to do today is read you the entire book. No. <laughs> um, as my husband said, just tell him to read the book and that'll be it. We can all leave and have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs> but what I'd like to do is maybe uh, share a little bit of context as to what qualifies me to be your keynote speaker today. Maybe read one or two passages from the book, but if the, I'll, I'll watch my time. We won't prolong it. But I want to close with a couple messages. So what qualifies me to stand up here today in front of this terrific audience and talk about addiction? About 11 years ago now, um, and I think Bernie's going to relate to this story, a addiction entered our household in the form of a phone call. It's late on an August night. The phone rings. I'm working at the hospital. My husband's a former mayor. We're pretty well known in Annapolis. It's my son's, one of my son's high school teachers, and he says, Lisa, I'm worried about Jacob. Several of his friends have come to me. They think he's drinking. They think he might be smoking marijuana. They aren't sure what he's doing, but I think you should talk with Jacob. From that moment on, my world totally shifted. Even though I've been in healthcare for decades, I personally knew nothing about addiction. Consequently, I didn't believe that it could possibly be in my family, not my child, right? Not in my household. So I go into denial. And for a long time, I refuse to see the signs. Even when I go into my son's room, looking for my Time magazine, which he borrows frequently. He's in high school, senior in high school open up the drawer of his dresser, pull out the Time magazine, and underneath it is this beautiful painted little vase with a long stem. <laughs> so some of you will know it as a mom. And at the time, I didn't want to believe that that's what it was. When I asked my son about it, his answer was, what do you think he said? <coughs> I'm holding it for a friend, of course. Things spiral, we get to Beach Week, he's arrested. He gets admitted to College Park, uh, University of Maryland. Our thought is just get him to college, get him to college, because they'll know how to fix him. They'll know how to take care of him. Freshman year is a disaster, he flunks out, he comes home. Two years at the community college. During that time, meanwhile, I'm trying desperately to hide everything. The shame of my son's addiction kept me isolated, but that's how I wanted it. At the time, I was terrified that anyone, even my closest friends, would find out that Jacob was using. What would that say about me? What kind of mother was I if my son was a drug addict? Clearly, I would failed the most basic purpose of my earthly life. It was impossible for me to face the fact that this child, who'd come from my womb, was now ingesting unknown and dangerous poisons into his body. 
the same precious miracle of cells and blood and veins that my own body had helped to form years ago. I had to fix this, or hadn't I failed as a mother? I continue to deny, I continue to hide it, finally faces me that Jacob needs help. We do get help. He goes to Father Martin Ashley. Actually, let me back up, because Bernie and I have that very, something very much in common. Bernie pulled his truck on the side of the road and tells Lauren to get out. We told our son Jacob, you've got a choice. You can either, um, you, 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 we gave him a choice. You cannot live under our roof and continue to use, or we'll pay for treatment. And what went through my head was, how can I send my gorgeous 21-year-old son, whom I adored more than breathing, um, how can I put him out on the street? I had visions of his being homeless, I had visions of him wearing tattered clothes, visions of him being hungry. Fortunately, he took treatment, and he wasn't ready. We sent him up to Father Martin's, uh, now called Ashley Treatment Center, and this lovely gentleman at our table is, uh, Tim is here with Ashley. It's a great place, it's beautiful, it's very spiritual. Do any of you know Father Martin's? Any of you know it? It's a gorgeous place. Anybody could get up all there. My son didn't. Uh, he used, he got kicked out. We took him into Pathways, which is part of the Animal Medical Center. And I was on the board of Pathways at the time. So imagine this. I'm sitting in a board meeting, in a beautiful room like this, looking out the window, praying I wouldn't see my son outside, praying that I wouldn't see him. Again, still trying to hide it. It was about that same time that a counselor gave me the advice that I needed. Keep in mind, this is my story. It's not so much my son's story. It's the story of a mother facing a child's addiction who is ashamed, you heard about stigma, who is fearful, who feels isolated, who is depressed. So fear, shame, isolation, depression, who else has those feelings? Well, they add themselves. My son was feeling the same feelings. So we, as those who love these people, these blessed people, suffer the same feelings that those who have substance use disorders feel. Meanwhile, the counselor said to me, Lisa, you've got to tell someone. You can't keep, you can't keep it like this. You've got to tell someone. And much credit to Chip Jordan, who was then the outgoing CEO of Arundel Medical Center, and Troy Bayless, now the incoming CEO of Arundel Medical Center. We were together in a room, and I said, Chip and Troy, I've got to tell you something. I stood up, I steered myself, and said, my son has a serious health problem. He's going to be a patient of Pathways. And they, to their credit, said, Lisa, you're not alone. We understand. If you need anything, let us know. So that alone was a huge relief, having told someone. Fast forward, Pathways sends Jacob to Florida. You all know addiction. You know that South Florida is a haven for recovery and relapse. Jacob goes to Florida. When he gets on a plane to leave, the counselor says to me, OK, Lisa, your son's going to have his program. What are you going to do for yourself? How do you think I reacted? I'm not the sick one. My son's the addict, right? I can barely finish a glass of wine, truth be told. So what does that mean? And then I thought about it. I'm crying all the time. I can't go to sleep at night until I hear his footfall on the stairs. I'm obsessed with where he is. I'm depressed. I haven't told anyone. I have a very close friend here today, a very, very close friend. She suspected something was going on, but I didn't even tell her. Well, I was, again, suffering the effects of the disease of addiction. I wasn't addicted, but I was suffering the same effects. He suggested I try Al-Anon. I don't know if any of you know about Al-Anon, but if you are suffering as I was, I urge you to at least consider it. I go to a meeting, anonymity is, is what protected me at the time. The second meeting I go to, one of my board members walks in. But we both realized we needed to be there. The third meeting, I go home and say to my husband, honey, come with me. Come to an al meeting with me. You don't have to stay. Come for, your, come for me the first time. Come for yourself if you want to after that. We have been going to an al meeting almost every Thursday night for almost seven years. We go now because we want to give back, and it, and it continues to ground us. Meanwhile, our son, I should finish that story, and then I'm going to close with a couple of messages. Our son, meanwhile, is in Florida. He has a rough first year. 
Um, at the end of his first year in Florida, we get a phone call, New Year's Eve. They say your son needs detox badly. Jacob went from drinking, which wasn't a quote unquote drug of choice, to marijuana, to God knows what else in Maryland, to Oxycontin pills, and then to heroin. A, a fairly typical progression. This was a little boy who couldn't stand needles and couldn't stand to swallow a pill, and he ends up, before he gets better, shooting heroin. Tough even for me to say it today. It's almost surreal to me. Today, he has been clean and healthy almost six years. <laughs> I'm going to make sure he hears that applause. Um, and we have been clean and healthy ourselves uh, for seven years because we've been going to Al-Anon. So we are both on a path. He stays active in AA. We stay active in Al-Anon. We do everything we can to help families. I take phone calls. I meet with mothers. I, I will do anything I can to help another mom or dad or family who is going through this, and too many are. Let me close with three messages. Number one, educate yourself. Sessions like this are helpful, but Sheriff Joe and I'm sure Bernie and Mike and others would gladly talk to you if you have if questions about substance abuse. Number two, if you're suffering, and I'll bet you there's at least one person in this room who is suffering from the effects of the disease of addiction. If you are, don't keep it secret like I did. Tell someone. Denial is deadly. In this disease, denial is deadly. Educate yourself, tell someone. And third, recovery is possible. So there is always hope. Always hope. There are four things we still need, and I'm sorry the Lieutenant Governor had to leave, but he'll, he'll hear us. Tell him. He'll hear from us. Or do you tell him? There are four things we still need. We need longer treatment. Two weeks, 30 days is just not enough. We need six months, nine months, a year. We need longer treatment. Number two, we need more solid, reputable recovery houses, like Sandhouse is, where someone can go from inpatient treatment, have that transition, that protected transition, to becoming a fully, full member of society again, paying taxes and living their lives. So we need more recovery houses. Number three, we need more help for families. And then finally, and you heard this from several of the speakers already, we need to start this education a lot younger, as, as Clay Stamp said, said, a lot younger. We, senior, yeah. <laughs> Seniors in high school are fine, but let's get to the fifth graders, the sixth graders, the seventh graders. Get to them a lot younger and get to them in your own families. And then finally, let me close with this. I would want to recommend a book to you called Dreamland. Anybody know it? Yeah. It was written by um, an author and journalist, Sam Quinones, uh, Q-U-I-O-N-E-N-S, called Dreamland. Sam narrates the, how opioids have overtaken this country, and it's particularly for those of you in the field. Um, I would strongly recommend it. I had the privilege of hearing Sam speak a couple weeks ago, and I want to close with something he said. You all know what Narcan is? Naloxone. It's the antidote to an opioid overdose. Okay. Sam says that naloxone is not the antidote to heroin. Heroin thrives in isolation. The antidote to heroin is community. And that's what we have here today. That's why we're going to solve it, because this is a strong community. And I want to thank you all so much for listening to me. Have a great day. Thank you. I've just been uh, reminded that the First Responders Fund is also for police and um, uh, sheriff's departments. By all first responders, sheriffs, police, and fire. And uh, we hope it'll be a very, very vital and but also a very uh, robust fund. Um, 
again, I want to thank everyone here, and I especially again want to acknowledge and congratulate our three recipients. I want you to know that we had many, many, many um, applications, people submitted applications for these awards, and it was extremely difficult to select three, but I think we did a good job. I think the three were extremely, <laughs> extremely worthy. That is probably the toughest part of this awards luncheon each year, is selecting the three honorees. And um, it's a good problem to have. It's a good problem to have. And so again, Lisa, thank you so much. Lisa will remain afterwards, first of all, to answer any personal questions or any questions that anyone here may have. She will be in the um, garden room, and she also, we want to thank her publisher, Apprentice House, who donated books, her book today, um, for us to sell, and all proceeds, they are giving up their share, all proceeds from the book will go toward the Founders Fund. So uh, I want to encourage you to purchase the book. It is, it is so rewarding and so gratifying to be chairing an event like this where the support from the community and everyone you speak to is just so, so helpful and so generous. Before we adjourn, I would like to ask our honorees and also the presenters, that I believe they've had their pictures taken. The governor, the lieutenant governor has left, so you can't have your picture taken with him. But anyway, um, you could have your picture taken with me if you'd like. No. <laughs> But what we do have in the other room for each of the honorees, we have a collection of citations that have been, uh, pr will be presented to you and we ask you to pick them up. The citations are from our Senator Steve Hershey, from Delegate Steve Ahrens, and the General Assembly, and also Congressman Harris and Congressman Ben Carter. So we congratulate you and ask you to please pick those citations up. And again, I just thank you so much for being here. I want to add a special thank you at the end. I know she'll be embarrassed, but I want to thank Deirdre Wilson for the centerpieces. Deirdre, thank you very, very much.